you all for coming today and thank you for organizing the session. So I'm going to talk a little bit, I mean, I'm not going to show you too much code, but if you all want to see it later, you can. It's more about the bigger picture in this case. But um, so today I'm focusing on the challenge of 3D data status, sorry, sustainability to make data, but to make data sustainable, um, we must make it reusable, right? We need to facilitate the reuse of our 3D data for multiple purposes. But, so what better way to keep something alive than to act actually use it, right? But how do we ensure that our data are not only preserved, but also reusable? Well, to make our data reusable, they must be accessible. Um, so we've been exploring the challenge of 3D data reuse in the context of the Maya City Builder Project. The long-term goal of this project is to allow uh, users to create alternative architectural reconstructions of ancient Maya cityscapes within a web-based environment in order to foster collaborative analysis and discourse. But to do this, we must make data accessible, not only in repositories like as dark archives, but we also must facilitate the reuse of these data. So uh, while the Maya City Builder Project research design has five, it's gonna die, my iPad, sorry, uh, five tracks, today we're gonna focus mostly on track three, which is kind of the import-export uh, uh, portion of it. So the case study that we've been working on to try to like narrow our data analysis down and work on things is the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Kupan, which is in Honduras, and located at the southeast periphery of the Maya world. Um, so, anyway. Um, but first, before I talk about uh, track three, I'm going to talk about track two, which is the way we've been kind of approaching this is from sort of the back end is looking at procedural modeling. And our goal is to generate a 3D model uh, or 3D library of ancient Maya architecture. So we're using this procedural modeling, which allows us to rapidly generate 3D models based on a set of rules, which many, maybe many of you are familiar with. And to create these two models, we're using 3D Engine, which is a um, 3D City Engine, which is a software that allows us to not only create 3D models from a set of rules, but also from a linked spatial database, which means that okay, it's not letting me see my notes, which is not nice. So, give me a moment. Do you know how to make it see all the notes? No. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I can't see them. Mm, all the notes? Yeah. You can scroll? Oh, okay. Do you, do you have a mouse or no? Um, no, we don't have a mouse. Oh, okay. So I'll do it this way? Yes. Yeah. Um, just use two fingers and oh. then do it like that. Two fingers like this. Or press once and then do it like that. Okay. Okay. Sorry. All right. So, sorry about that. Find it. So, Basically, so we're using procedural modeling, and in the Maya region, um, most of the architecture looks like this, right? And so then we have um, resultant GIS data, um, which looks like this. Um, uh, but for certain analysis and comparative city analysis, we don't want to just have sort of block architecture, which we get from GIS. Instead, we want to have things like that look like this, with stairways and medial molding and et cetera. Right? So the procedural modeling allows us to do this quite rapidly. And here on this uh, slide is an example of the procedural modeling rule for one type of site at Copan. And so on the left, what you're seeing here is the CGA code, um, which is the computer-generated architecture, which is specific to City Engine. Um, and to give you a quick idea how this works, right, we have a lot here, which you can see highlighted in red. This is the same thing as a GIS footprint. And then from this, we write certain rules, and then they build the architecture quite quickly, right, from the spatial database based on a set of rules. And you can do this mathematically or otherwise. Um, so, however, while the program City Engine can make the generation of 3D models quite rapid, the 3D visualization environment is limited, right, in regard to lighting, texturing, vegetation. In other words, the aesthetic elements of the landscape seem rigid, cold, unnatural, right? 
So this makes City Engine useful for many aspects, but not necessarily for others, right? And it's quite expensive. So the objective now, turning to track three <coughs> of, the, of the Maya City Builder project, is, um, which is the main theme of today's talk, is the development of import and export workflows to make the process of bringing and subsequently working with procedurally generated and other 3D models into 3D virtual environments easier. So in this example, in Unit, we're using Unity, and uh, we're working to make these 3D models reusable beyond our own research. So in this process, we've developed three workflows. We begin with a manual uh, approach um, to understand the variables and steps involved, involved, and then we move to a semi-automated, and now we continue to work on a more automated um, workflow that allows us to move away from the reliance on proprietary software to using open soft software. So today I'll briefly show you some of these workflows, but emphasize kind of the pros and cons of these and sort of the process that we went through um, in each of these steps. Maybe. So um, here's an example. This is the first workflow, which represents our first attempts. And it was a very manual approach, um, and so it uses very all proprietary software, really, ArcGIS, City Engine, and Unity, in order to create and visualize uh, the data. Um, as for the uh, the pros of this workflow, right, it offers very accurate georeferencing of structures or objects based on the GIS data. Um, there's a minimal amount of work by users, um, which is necessary for putting the building placement, right. It, automatically generated via the georeferencing. Um, the terrain can be um, as accurate as the data from which it's derived. So in this case, we have LiDAR data um, in Honduras from this. Um, however, the cons are, uh, in this case, right, it's expensive, it requires proprietary software, and depending on the level of, de of detail desire, can require a lot of work, right? And many, many hours in order to properly design and create the environmental details such as terrain, textures, grasses, plants, etc. So then we moved on after learning from this step into the second workflow, which is kind of semi-automated and focuses on the ability to procedurally generate not only the buildings, but the terrain as well as vegetation. So um, in this case, the, the pros are for this workflow, really it, it's working on sort of emphasizing towards getting this the end, the end goal, which is more procedural modeling, right, for the environment, rather than having to do it by hand. Um, so um, in workflow two, it's less expensive, it's more accessible, um, and it allows us to do um, all the GIS work in, um, GI in QGIS, quantum GIS, instead of ArcGIS, um, and then use Gaia, which is only a $40 um, plugin that allows you to do procedural modeling within Unity, um, to generate from um, basically a shape, shape file, which is converted right into an um, image, uh, to build terrain and vegetation. And then it allows you to do references. However, there are some cons to this method, as we found out. So. Sorry, I seem to be challenged with the whole uh, finger thing, yeah. Uh, all right, so, <laughs> right, no, not the right one. Sorry. So, um, depending on the purposes of your model, right, and what you're trying to do, there can be a decrease in structure location accuracy. And the terrain model detail is compared to workflow one. So it's more efficient, but yet maybe potentially it's less accurate. So, and this is due to the constraints of having to use anchor points in the shape file, and then you bring it in and sort of stretch it out within uh, Unity, in this case. So, ideally, oops, let's see if I can get this. The video would work, ideally, but not in this case. <laughs> Oh, it's working. Okay, it doesn't work on here. All right. Anyway, we'd use procedural modeling for both the buildings and vegetation, right? 
So we would have a hybrid of these workflows one and two, um, and this requires then City Engine, Gaia, and Speedtree, which is another program which we're using to procedurally model, model vegetation. So we sort of went through this learning process. Um, and then our third workflow, really, in which we're not necessarily our endpoint, but um, what we're working to in, um, is sort of automating the process with the user interface modules. So we've been scripting in Unity and using C Sharp. Um, and the process involves bringing in georeference building footprints um, and then selecting module uh, interfaces that we've developed in order to perform specific tasks. So, so far we've created four tasks in Unity. So um, this model here um, automatically places um, models from an imported 3D library, so it relates back to our procedural modeling, and you bring this in, and instead of having to be familiar or very um, an expert in Unity, you can just sort of use the model, the model loader okay. um, and bring in the modules. Um, so, and then this model, um, then once they're brought in, you can see that they wouldn't be automatically scaled, right? They come into the footprint. So we've created another um, in C Sharp. We can, you can automatically scale the footprint and the building height, um, depending on input factors, et cetera, um, and bring these data in. In addition to that, um, we are also created a, a model to rotate. So. Normally, I mean, part of this goes back to the fact that City Engine and other things normally um, orient towards streets, and in my art, the wire world, we don't necessarily have streets, so we have to orient in another way, right? And so we've created a way to um, just kind of push, push button click in order to rotate your model. See the way that works? It kind of works just like that. And then finally, we've been working to create code that will import the 3D models, in this case we've been focusing on OBJs, um, into a database automatically, right? So this, this code works by reading into memory all the OBJ files specified, um, and then it looks for reference for the MTL file. Uh, and then um, the MT file is read into memory looking for references. Um, Sorry. Anyway, uh, sorry. So anyway, the point of this, so I'm just going to talk. It'll be easier. <laughs> so anyway, the point is, is that we've, we're trying to, we're working on ways to bring um, OBJs and other kinds of 3D files. And so when people bring them into, um, uh, from different databases, whether it be uh, Post Postgres or something, um, or Access or something else, it will automatically take those and, cre and create the database um, construction that you need. And so here you can just see the four basic files. So this, you can bring in an, o, o, an OBJ and it will convert that into a database format that you can then use to connect back to your database and bring into Unity or whatever. Um, so um, basically the next steps in, in this, we're just carrying out research, um, we're developing these workflows, we're doing this with multiple kind of 3D data, um, in this case, you can see some of the, we have, arc, we have um, ceramics data, we have architectural data, um, and other kinds of things. So uh, basically, I'll just show you this. So another key component in which we're trying to focus on and thinking about the, um, thinking about um, making code accessible, but maybe even less so than code in thinking about 3D modeling is how do we make the paradata, the modeling decisions that were made behind it accessible. So we've been working to try to bring in an immunity and this is the information for uh, one of the hypothetical reconstructions that we have. So up here you see the uh, laser scanning and, and photogrammetry data that we have for the building and then in the 3D environment you have the hypothetical reconstruction and there's data associated with it that you can see as you move through and kind of get a feeling and try to understand uh, what might be going on. So this is more kind of a public aspect rather than a research aspect in a sense. So, um, and then yeah, so to kind of further promote um, reuse and data, <laughs> um, 
then we've been um, working to sort of get this data out into the public. So we have a lot of back-end stuff that we do for research purposes and development, but at the same time we're creating a lot of data, right? So we want to get this out to the public and have it be reusable, right? So to make it sustainable and reusable beyond the code, right, which will facilitate, we also want to make the public um, have access to it and sort of experiment with things in different ways. So. Anyway, uh, to close, <laughs> we want to emphasize or re-emphasize that uh, for us to achieve data sustainability for 3D content in cultural heritage, we must promote and facilitate data reuse. So really the basic goal of today was kind of, I guess, to sort of put forth the point that in order to make um, the code relevant, really, we need to like integrate it into the larger framework of data sustainability and reuse. So, anyway. Thank you.